Welcome to the Corner Office, where we bring you the latest news from the world of commercial real estate, the greatest voices in the industry, and the corporate chats you've been missing. Let's get to it. Hello and welcome to the Financial Bunny TV. My name is Nicolette Mashile, and I'm also known as the Financial Bunny. Today is going to be a very interesting conversation. I know we always talk about investing in property, investing in real estate. And for a majority of us, our gateway into it is always residential property. We talk about buying for rental, and that's about where most of us want to stop. But there's a whole world out there of commercial property. And today, I get the opportunity to speak to John. Jonathan Jack, who's the CEO of Galetti Corporate Real Estate, and he's going to take us a little bit into what are some of the opportunities that do exist within corporate or commercial property, rather. Now, do you remember, none of my videos constitute as financial advice. However, if you are looking for financial advice, please do speak to somebody who is certified and registered with the FSCA. John, welcome to Financial Bunny TV. I knew I shouldn't have told you my name was Jonathan. <laughs> I knew it. I, I knew off the bat. I was like, that's what's going to happen. I'm gonna call me <laughs> but that's your name, sir. Yeah. That's your home affairs name, isn't it's it? It's my home affairs name. I think I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. Why? Legally. I'm going to legally change it to John, and then I can officially know that I'm John. Oh, we sympathize with yeah, you. Thanks. Can I tell you something, though? I get asked all the time, what's your African name? And then I stand there, and I'm like, it's Nicolette. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say, because... Tough I mean, I wasn't there when my parents were naming me. Tough so, like, crowd, how do yeah. I answer that? Yeah. Can I tell what my full names are? Yeah. And I guess? No. <laughs> it's Nicolette Nadia Machine. Nice. Right? Okay, John. I'm going to call you John from now on. Right, guys? Now, please note, if I say John, I am referring to Jonathan Jack. Let's talk a little bit about property. I mean, I think for a majority of people, we've been sold that property is this Hail Mary asset that one can invest in, and you can become a real estate billionaire. Is it really all that we hear about it? You know, this market's had a phenomenal run. I mean, literally, I think we went from really, really high interest rates at the end of 98, where, you know, basically what happens is yields or your returns on property track the interest rates largely. I mean, not, oh. not identically, but they track the interest rates. So if your risk-free money is, is sitting at 15%, so let's say the bank, you put your money in the bank and they would give you 15%, then why would you buy a property that's going to give you 10%. Mm -hmm. So it loosely tracks those interest rates or your risk-free rate, your long bond rate, you know, the government 10-year uh, bonds type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So in 98, the interest rates just went ballistic. They mm -hmm. went really, really high. Mm -hmm. And so yields obviously tracked those up. And then what happened is you had a whole new market, you know, post-94, now you've got a whole new market. Money's coming into the economy. The middle class is growing significantly. Mm -hmm. And so there's more spend. And so businesses are growing. GDP growth is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And GDP growth is really what drives property prices at the same time or, or growth in the capital value of properties at the same time, right? Okay. So going into the early 2000s, you just have property value is going up 30% year on year. Now, property is also something that you borrow money on. So if you buy a million rand property, mm -hmm. in residential, you typically go and put in 10%. In mm -hmm. commercial, you're going to put in 30%. And, and so ultimately what happens is if you have a 30% growth on your property, mm -hmm. you have a 30% growth on your cash, which is only 30%. So you've got 100% growth on your money. Ah. And this was just happening year after year. So people were making ridiculous money in those early 2000 period. Yes. And that run... Pretty much besides for 2008, where it dropped off again, it started to build up and it ran all the way to sort of 2018. So people have made fortunes, fortunes. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, banks were also giving you 100%. So you didn't even have to put cash in. You were, you were, you, you know, you were making money for nothing. So yeah. that was the market. But 2008 was because of property. <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a lot of risky capital in the market, just free money. You know, we, We've seen a similar thing now, right? Yeah. Which is why you had your crypto stock. So basically the, the cost of borrowing money was next to nothing around the world. So mm. people would just borrow money mm. and put it into risky assets. Mm. But you've seen all the cryptos crash and you've seen a lot of those more speculative assets crash. You know, your, your tech stocks, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They've fallen right off because there's... Interest rates are climbing around the world because of all of the inflation that they're trying to stop. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what's happening is people are taking their money out of risky assets. Mm -hmm. You've probably mm -hmm. seen a lot mm -hmm. of like, 
you know, where the guy's got the the Porsche and the mm-hmm. second car and the third car. You've seen a couple of those getting sold out. Yeah, yeah. So People are going back to what they know and cash. what they... <laughs> getting hold of their cash. Yeah, yeah. true, true. And, and I guess when I started the conversation, one of the things I mentioned is the fact that the majority of us, when we talk about investing in real estate or let's, 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 let's break it down to in property, yeah. um, we'll come to, you know, your, your real estate stocks and all of that. When you, when you talk about investing in property, a general mm-hmm. amount of people will go towards residential property. Sure. Why do you think that? Is it is it an information thing? Is it a not knowing access? Or oh, it's a money thing? Money, cash. As you gestured, money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cash available. So, look, the reality in this thing is, in residential property, it's probably 10% down. So the yeah. bank is going to give you, you know, largely, the bank's going to give you 90%, yeah. and you have to put in 10%. You can also go buy a million rand property, two million rand property, even less, you can buy in the 500,000, 600,000 rand, you've got to put in 10%. That's yeah. achievable, mm. you know, for the middle class, et cetera, and, and upward. That's achievable money. You can go and find 60,000 rand, 100,000 rand, et cetera, and buy it, put a 10 and 10, and you start your property portfolio. Mm-hmm. Commercial property is different. They require 30%, and they only fund 70%. Okay? okay. So now you've got to come up with 30% of the value bigger number three times bigger yeah and secondly the bank will only fund the property over 10 years not 20 years oh okay so your repayments on residential property are lower because it's funded over a longer time absolutely and on commercial property higher so typically what you'll see is you'll see a higher return on commercial property Uh okay so residential property you'll see these six seven percent returns that's because you have stretched your borrowing out over a longer period so people can actually just make it work. Yeah. And you typically, in good areas, get a nice capital growth. So that's the story in, in residential property. Commercial property is just different. Mm, you know, mm. You've really got to look at the underlying tenant. Those tenants are going to be in there for a year, three years, five mm. years, seven years, ten yeah. years. Mm. You know, and, and obviously, the longer that there are tenants in there, better for you you don't have vacancy etc etc so there's so many things that come together when you're looking at a commercial property but the big thing is why is it hard to enter the market Mm -hmm. cash it's a cash issue and i'm just thinking also the reliability of the tenants that you're going to get as you said you know critical (laughs) it's very critical i just even in residential property you get some very unscrupulous uh, characters you know renting out i can imagine it's even worse when it comes to commercial property considering the fact that some businesses just don't make it you know it's the hard thing about about commercial property because you've got to look at that we call it a covenant so what is the, the covenant is the strength of the tenant so okay. what is the strength of your covenant and and basically it sits at that risk-free rate right so let's say the government is borrowing money at a 10 percent they'll pay you 10 percent they'll borrow your money you yeah, know? yeah they raise a bond yes and so effectively that's your risk-free because the technically the sovereign has the highest credit rate yeah technically <laughs> so you, you have this high credit rating of the sovereign, right? Yes. That is just risk-free money for you. So as an investment, that's the, that's the risk-free rate. Uh-huh. So what happens after that is, depending on looking 10 years ahead, how much vacancy are you going to see in your property? How much maintenance are you going to have to do in your property? How specialized in your property and is your property and how likely are you to replace that tenant short yours mm-hmm. default? Mm-hmm. So if you had a 10-year lease with a bank, that's mm-hmm. fantastic. You, you're you not expecting ABSA to default and you've got 10 years of income, so you don't apply a lot of risk on top of the risk-free rate, right? Mm-hmm. However, if you've got a short-term lease, your tenant might not renew, which means yeah. you're going to have a vacancy period. Who are you going to replace it with? Or if you have a poor tenant, which means they might default. Even, yeah. if, the, even if it is a 10-year lease yeah. and it's not such a great tenant, you're going to add some risk. So that's how people de- largely determine what the yield is on property. Yeah, people saying, what yield is that property on commercial property? It's all about the yield, yield. People yes. value the property on the yield. Yes. And basically, what they're trying to say is they're trying to adjust f- for risk. Oh. So at the moment, oh. you know, a prime property, cat A, great property, new, doesn't need a lot of maintenance and it's got a great tenant in you're probably paying 9% in the 9% range, 9, yes. 9 and a quarter, 9, 5, et cetera, yes. return-wise. And then going from there, you just add risk. So if you've got a poor tenant in not such a great area, you older building, 12, 13, ah. 14%. And so uh-huh. you get a higher return based on the fact that there's a little bit more risk in that one. Yeah, it sounds like um, how the banks give you um, credits. So you've got 100%. the unsecured and the secured <laughs> credits. Correct. So basically, if they see that you're a bit of a risky yeah. person, they'll obviously bump up they're how much they charge they're you. They're going to give you better terms if you're yeah. buying a tenure lease with the bank than yeah. you know buying this thing with a three-year lease. They're going to give you better terms. Oh. So it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Let's, let's, t- let's go back to that um, halo conversation, the money. 
Mm. So where does one find money then mm. to invest in commercial mm. property? What are the what are the options that are available out there? Yeah. Listen, you piqued my interest the other day when you were talking about stockfalls because obviously that's pretty much the most untapped yeah. market in Absolutely. the country. Mm. And and largely that money is never invested that well. You know, sometimes there are like larger stockfall groups mm. and they have some kind of asset management around it. Mm. But Property is just one of those assets that has a very low risk rating, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be to to have to get into that market, mm -hmm. have almost like an asset manager that really understands where that money's going and what they're investing in, and then invest that money. And don't gear it up as much. Mm -hmm. You know, reduce the risk on that property. So mm -hmm. typically, like I said, you can gear up to 70%. Yeah. Don't. Don't. You, you don't have to. Uh, yeah. Gear to 50% or gear to 40% or whatever it is. Act like the listed funds do. You know, the listed funds will only gear to 40%. Mm. So do that. Use some gearing because the gearing, and I'll explain the thinking behind gearing, but it it's such a low-risk return, especially in this market where we're, we've had every single supply shock, every single you know shock that you can have. You, we've got high inflation. We've got a war in the Ukraine. We've yeah. just had two years of pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's the worst that it can be. So you're going to start finding some of the best opportunities in the market at the moment. Mm -hmm. Take that stock fall, invest it into a property, and then you have a growth asset with stable income, stable returns. It's just it's such a great market. So that mm -hmm. that putting together uh, is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the entrepreneur that runs their own business, they should be looking for the property to buy to run their business out of. Ah, okay. so not so renting warehouses and all of that yeah. stuff, yeah. To them, it might, you know, for the business or for, you know, from the outside of them, might say, okay, well, this is not a bank. It's a, you know, it's a, a business that's operating. So how do we finance that? Or, you know, is, is that a building that we want to buy? But yeah. for the operator, it's much lower risk for them because okay. that business is intrinsically attached to them. Yeah. And they understand the risk profile of that business. They can go and buy their own building and then pay themselves rental effectively. Always better to put in two different entities, have your prop co and have your your your, your op co and separate the two because then you can sell. Sorry, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're speaking too fast. <laughs> prop co, op co, so property company. Property company. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And your operational yeah, company. Company. Yeah. So your actual company. So so I mean, really. You know, business or commercial property is always bought in a PTY or a trust, yes, or it's yes. never bought by the individual. Okay. Okay, because typically there are VAT implications to it, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So you house it in its own entity. So uh -huh. that is a going concern. Uh -huh. It's its own thing. Because uh -huh. then you can also sell that entity, uh, take your business out of there when you expand, put someone else in there. It's, an, it's its own business. Uh -huh. And then you have your own, your business, paint manufacturer, shoe manufacturer, supplier, logistics, whatever it is. This is a separate thing. Yes. You can also sell your business and keep your property business. Yes. It's always better to keep these two apart, yeah. Okay, I, I want to paint a picture. So there is financial fitness bunnies, which is a PTY LTD. We do content. We now need to buy a space to create a studio so that we can shoot from there. So we, be, we buy a warehouse. So you're saying don't buy the warehouse under financial fitness bunnies. You create a separate entity. You buy the, the studio. Then this company, financial fitness bunny, must pay rent to the property company. Correct. I like that. That's clever. Yeah. That's very, very clever. Keep your keep your things separate. Yeah. And I always have a tenant. You like can also bring in a partner over here and you don't uh -huh. have to bring in a partner over here. Or you can oh. bring in a partner over here and not over here. So yes. keep the things separate. They're very different businesses. Yeah. Okay, that, that's quite interesting. Yeah. But I think also one of the big things that, and, and I guess we've started tapping into some of the conversations in terms of what commercial property opportunities are out there. Now, when I went to the Galeti auction, it was like a, the biggest shock of my life because there were petrol stations, there were blocks of flats, there were residential. But talk to me about what are some of the opportunities that do exist in that space. Sure, yeah. So typically you've got the different sectors, right? So you've got hospitality, which is hotels and lodges and yeah. Airbnbs and that kind of thing. That's yeah. one sector. Uh -huh. You've got energy, which is petrol stations and related activities, depots and that type of thing. You know, people you buy those things? It's like oh, real yeah. people that buy oh, yeah. depots? Big time. Depot, really? get the trucks in there, fill them in, store the fuel. You can even have a fuel depot and then run a whole lot of wholesale business where the trucks fill up and that kind of thing. So it's, it's quite an interesting space. But us usually in that space, the owners of the property are quite close to the actual operations of the oh, business. Oh, the actual, usually, yeah, yeah. Okay, usually, okay. Not always, but usually. 
That's the other one. And then, of course, there's office, retail, industrial. Just hold on. Before you move it to office, retail, and industrial, when you're buying in the energy space, when you're buying, for instance, a fuel station, mm. do you also buy the land? Like, how does it work? Mm. Is yeah. the land attached yeah, yeah. to the property? There's so many different structures. It's actually yeah. got an interesting space. So you can own, you can buy the land yeah. and have literally nothing on it, yes. just the license. And someone yes. else will come and build everything, the tanks, everything, and they'll run an operation and then out of that operation, they will give you a margin on on the land on, on, on yeah. how much fuel they pump. Oh, oh, so that, okay. So you, that's how much that's how you structure it. So people always say, "What's it pumping?" You know. Yes. So three hundred thousand liters is kind of the break even, as it were. That's like a good business. Yes. And then it goes up. You've got seven hundred thousand. You know, like you've got you know guys pumping a lot of literage, and basically you get a margin on that, or you can just arrange a rental. There are yeah. lots of different structures there. So oh we've got wow. a we've got a division here that actually focuses on that. So the different structures and the different mm. methodologies and investments mm. and they know where they are all around the country. Mm. Then there's obviously office, industrial, retail. These are the obvious ones. Shopping centers, small, mm. large. You know, they're, they're different players in the different sectors. Mm -hmm. Shopping centers are like 1,300 in the country. They range from 1,000. They range from 500 square meters to the little retail one that you yeah. see. And then they go all the way up to 80, 100, 120, 135,000 square meters. So these things are enormous, you know. Yeah. And obviously in the bigger cap space, you've got the funds playing, um, the listed guys, and then the smaller cap guys, you've got everyone. You know? Yeah. Uh, and then industrial, industrial's been the darling because everything's going logistics, retail. There's a sense that retail is going to take some pain, mm, uh, mm. and globally it has because mm. you can just order online. Mm. However, in South Africa, we have a culture of going to, to the, the shops. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, in Johannesburg, we have a culture <laughs> of going to the shop. In, in Cape, Cape Town, Town people different. are probably going to order online. So yeah. that's what it is. So I think some of the retail is going to take some pain. Industrial's been great because everyone wants logistics now yeah. and the new the new style of building with. Far less columns, Absolutely. And far more efficient, higher roofs, all that kind of thing. Absolutely. And then offices. Offices have got destroyed in COVID mm. uh, because everyone started working from home. Mm. And you find different businesses going back and different businesses staying working at home. So if you've got like, typically what happens is the the kind of lowest tier of the company or the the, the, the guys just general staff, mm. they were back immediately because they mm. can't stand sitting at home, mm. like staying in an apartment, whatever it is. The senior executive also back quickly because they want to keep the culture of the business and mm. all the rest of it. Mm. But the middle management and the middle the middle earners, they are trying to stay at home because uh -huh. they've probably got quite a nice home. Yeah, They now don't have anyone looking over their That's true. shoulders. Uh, yeah, so this is the story. Yeah. The other thing is you get the different types of industries. So the creatives and the IT guys, they probably want to stay at home because they're not at home. They work at night. They do different things. They, yeah. you know, they're in a different space. Yeah. And um, but the deal makers and the banks and the people who are client facing, they're all back. Yeah. At the and there's a, a trend of, of of turning office spaces into residential blocks mm. now. So yeah. how did that shift happen? Well, basically, there were so many offices and people <laughs> were desperate to get rid of them. So, so basically, what happened is there was such an oversupply of offices because now. Everyone was reducing the footprint of what they required. Yeah. And so you get a net surplus in the market. Now you can't find a tenant. You don't know what to do with the space. And ultimately you've got to sell it for a rock bottom price. People say, well, you know, a good idea would be to turn this into residential. And so yeah. they do. Um, it's just a, it was just an opportunity that existed in the market in a period of time. Yeah. And if you're doing that, you would need to go through what, rezoning the space, pumping a lot of more money to try and make it into residential, bathrooms, yeah. adding all those things. Yeah. Is it not a costly exercise? Oh, it's huge. You've got to get that at sort of, in Johannesburg, you'd be getting in a really good area. You're going to be getting in a sort of five, 6,000 rand a square meter, mm. which is really low mm. when you consider that a uh, couple of years ago, the premium spaces were selling at 45,000 rand a square meter. Mm. It's so, Sam premium space is now selling at 25,000 rand a square meter. And so it just tumbles. So to get it for 5,000 rand a square meter, which bearing in mind is what industrial was selling for. Mm. Uh, and now industrial has gone the other way. Now industrial you can't get for, I mean, 5,000 rand a square meter for industrial is a bargain, mainly because the steel prices have gone ballistic. So it's really expensive to build. So it, it's just uh, the whole market's changed. Mm. Industrial is now more expensive than office property in Santon. Yeah. That's crazy. And I guess that's where yeah. the demand is. So that's it makes demand, absolute yeah. sense. Now, off air, we spoke about um, a, a funding slash investment strategy. You mm. talked about having a carrier. Can you just take yeah, us yeah. through that? Yeah, yeah. So if you find a great opportunity, let's say you go and find a retail center, you're a creative person, you say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to knock down this piece. We're going to create a courtyard. All the rentals are at this moment are really low and they're mm. bad tenants. But we can renovate this property. And I think we're going to spend 
a million rand, two million rand, and mm. we can get the property for 10 million rand. Mm. Mm. So we're all in for 12 million rand, and we can re-tenant this thing. And suddenly the tenants are going to go from paying 40 rand a square meter to mm. paying 120 rand a square meter, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit less GLA, but you create a great investment opportunity. And what you see is that the value of the property is going to go way past 12 million rand. It's going to shoot to 18 million rand. Now mm. you've got an idea. You've got a concept, but you need the money. Yes. So what you would do is then go and approach a, an investor, maybe someone in the area who also understands opportunity. Mm. You would put in an offer to purchase with a due diligence period in it. And in that period, you say to that investor, listen, I've optioned this property. Okay. I have a concept. I've costed it. I've done everything. I need money. Yes. You then create an entity where let's say you have 20% of that entity and the investor has 80%. Uh -huh. He will lend money in at a return to himself. Uh -huh. And then... What comes out of that property is, and then you're going to borrow the rest from the bank. Yeah. And what's going to come out of that property ultimately is a m far higher value property, and it's going to earn returns, or you can sell it for a, for for a higher number or whatever it might be. And then after he's paid back, and after the bank's paid back, you then split it in an eighty twenty ratio, and that's how you get into property. You've got a funder or a backer, yeah, and they call it getting a carry. So oh. you get a carry into that mechanism. Usually, you'd have to put your twenty percent in, but he's put it in for you. At an interest rate, yeah. Would it be the same if you are not necessarily lending from him, but you're raising capital through equ giving him equity? Yeah, I exactly. Yeah, he's he's loaning debt capital in, yeah, um, and you're getting equity. He's getting equity in the business, and yeah. but you're putting in sweat equity. You're creating the equity. Yes, in this, yes, in this company, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Same thing. I think let's talk a little bit about return on investment. Look, at, uh, you spoke about yields. You spoke about, you know, I just want to get a, a better picture in terms of what can one really expect um, in terms of a return on investment and what is the, um, the CAPEX rate in South Africa? Yeah. So just to describe what return is, right? Yes. So you've got to look at total return. Total return is the sum of your, your income return or your yes. CAPEX or yield or whatever yes. it is. And the capital appreciation of that project. Uh -huh. Okay, so in some, so you add the two together, and then you've got your total return on uh -huh. that project for uh -huh. a period, whatever uh -huh. it might be. So if you are doing a project which doesn't have any income, then you've got to look at what the what the return on on what the capital appreciation is going to be. So let's say you renovate it, you're doing something, you buy it and you sell it. That's a capital return. Yeah. If you buy a property and then you you. you Typically, this happens in retail, but you get in there, you improve the tenant mix, you do some light upgrades. Uh -huh. That property is going to be worth more as a result of the tenants now paying more and you having better tenants, more, you know, less vacancy, it turns a better center. Now the rentals, not, on, not only the rentals go up, mm. but also the vacancy goes down. Mm -hmm. You get a capital return mm -hmm. and you have yield coming in at the same time. So it's a balancing thing. Mm. Typically, when you see a low uh, capital appreciation, you're gonna have a higher yield. Uh -huh. okay, you don't you don't think that the rentals are gonna jump from thirty to forty or fifty or whatever it is. You just think they're gonna stay in that kind of range. Yeah. So therefore, you need to have some kind of uh, re re actual yield on that property. The yield's gonna be higher. So you'll buy the property for cheaper. And you'll keep the same rental, but it's gonna be a higher yield. Yes. You know, so that's yes. A, an example of a B grade property, or whatever it is. Uh -huh. Sometimes you think, "Geez, I'm buying this really low rentals. Those rentals are gonna double." Then you're happy to pay more for the property on the basis the rent is going to double your gonna capital is going to yeah and so it's just a balancing act right uh. so what's the right number you know people always look at they want to get you know they talk about an IRR you know an IRR is how much money do I put out what are my returns over the period and then when I sell it at the end what what's my yeah. number going to be you know yeah. so people are always chasing like a twenty percent IRR in property okay mm, over mm, time. Mm. But effectively, when you look at a yield and the difference between a yield and a capex being technical now, mm. is a capex of what you state in the market. You say, what, what's the or cap rate at least, not capex. So mm. if you say, what's a cap rate for that property? It's a five-year property. It's got a decent tenants in this area. You say, the cap rate for that property should be 10%. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a quoted market norm. Mm. Yield, on the other hand, is, a, is derived. Mm -hmm. When you actually buy the property and you take what? the value of the property and you divide the net income by the mm. value, you mm. get a yield. And mm. so the yield might be 9.12, mm. whereas the cap rate that you quoted is you should be buying that property at nine or nine and a quarter. Mm. That's the quoted. So you it depends on the property. If you're buying a triple A grade property with a bank as a tenant and a 10-year lease or it's a nice logistics property or whatever it is, you can probably pay 9% and maybe just a little bit under nine, nine eight, seven, five, nine, mm. around that level. Mm. Once it starts going to a shorter lease, maybe not as bulletproof a tenant or maybe the property is not a P-grade property, then you start moving upwards, 10s, 11s. Mm -hmm. If it starts going B, C-grade property with a short-term lease, 
14s, 15s, and so it carries on going. So it's all a, it's just a bit of a balancing act. They're external and internal factors that determine your yield. And it's all just market knowledge. So you've got to go and find a good broker or a good mentor mm. or a good co-partner mm. or whatever mm. it is. They'll guide you as to the to the process. Mm. Yeah. And, 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 and when you're buying residential property, a lot of people struggle to understand that they are in a business, especially yes. if they're buying it for investment purposes. Oh yeah, yeah. How important is it to see your commercial property as an investment? It's the only way to. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way. You can't get attached to your investments. Yeah. You, must be, you must know how you're going to exit that property. What's uh -huh. plan B? When you go in, you make your money when you buy property, not yes. by holding the property. You make it when you buy. You get a good value and you make sure you know how to exit in the case of something going wrong. What are you going to do to get out of this thing? Once you know those two things, you buy the property. If you don't know how you're going to get out of it, don't buy it. That's so don't get cool attached. because when you buy residential people, people don't buy it with the mind of location, 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 mm. buy for selling and whatever. So you're saying when you – say that again. when You you make your money when you buy, buy because yes. you must buy at the right value because uh -huh. then everything is upside from there. Uh -huh. If you buy too high, then you'll never make your money because it will never play into the value, right? Uh -huh. so make your money when you buy and when you buy, you must know how you're going to exit. So what's yes. your plan B? This tenant, the tenant goes bang. What are you going to do now? Yes. Who are you going to fill it with? Where, how are you going to sell this property? What's your mechanism? What's your exit? What is your strategy? And if you know that, you're always in a good position. People buy properties, they have no idea how they're going to sell the thing. Of course not. <laughs> they're just like, do you know how important it is one time yeah. for some people, a group of people in this country to just own yeah. something, yeah. you know? So I think a lot of people do that where they buy just with this idea that I own this thing. Yeah. But it, it makes no mathematical sense, no, no financial sense. Don't get sense. attached. Don't get attached. Yeah, but I think there's a lot know, one, of one of my mentors always said to me, I said, oh, this property, I don't buy you know, my own home. Yeah. I don't want to buy this thing. You know, it's the bad return. He says, sometimes the return is your lifestyle you know, and ah. your life. So you must also, when you buy your own home, it's not an investment. It's yes. your lifestyle, it's your yes. life, it's your yes. family, it's yes. where your kids are going to grow up, all the rest of it. That's how you buy your residential properties. You can probably overspend all the rest. Invest yes. in your lifestyle. Yes. But if you buy something that's not your home, make sure you do not love it. You know, put love into it, but don't love it. That is so clear. That's actually the best like uh, advice I've ever heard in terms of buying property. And I think uh, from a more residential side of things, because I'm looking at um, one of my chapters in my book is I hate my house yeah. because I really think I bought it with this idea that, oh my gosh, I love this house. It's and a romance. I'm like, oh, it's a romance, right? Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is not it. I have never swam in that pool. I have a pool. I've been there for six years. I've probably been in there three times yeah. and it just makes no sense to me. Yeah. So I think we can segue straight into looking at some tips and tricks of becoming a successful commercial property investor. But before we get into that, I want to take you back all those years ago. First deal. What did? First what was deal. it? What did it look like? First and what was deal. the best advice you got? First deal, Blackie, yes. owned by the late Vivian Slade. He uh -huh. had a, a, an entity called Indy Sue and he owned a series of little warehouses, whatever. It was like yeah. 330 square meters, lease one year. And I still remember I, at that point in time, I worked for this business and the the head accountant or FD or whatever, he's an old guy, Mr. Rabinovitz, and he insisted that when you got paid, yeah. you come and collect your check from his office. Oh, nice. So you had to then go to his office, get the check. And oh, there's well, a whole talk. Well done, my boy. <laughs> and then you had to like run down to Nedbank and go and cash the thing. And if you banked with Nedbank, when I was with F&B, yeah. they would actually clear it like immediately. So oh, obviously nice. all of us changed our bank accounts to Nedbank, to Nedbank. <laughs> immediately. And then you could go cash for check and get your money. I remember it was 3,850 Rand was yes. my first commission check of which I got half. So 1,750 Rand. So oh, wow. Tiny little deal. But yeah. it, was, uh, it was got me really excited and to get into the industry. You know? Yeah. So, yeah and was what was the best advice that you ever got around just deal making? You know, uh, be willing to walk away from the deal. You yeah. Know? Um, mm. You don't have anything until you're willing to lose it. And that mm -hmm. stands for everything in life, I yeah. think. You know, if you're, just, if you're so desperate to have the deal or to do something or to get into this relationship or have this person as a friend or work for it, if you're so desperate, then you don't do things on your own terms. Yeah. You know? yeah. So you should be willing to lose it. And yeah. that's the best sort of energy to hold when doing a deal. Yeah. Want to do it, act professionally, push, find solutions, keep pivoting through every type of solution you can find to get the deal done yeah but we'll be willing to walk away yeah um and i've seen some of the best deals done some of the investors like that's my last deal mm. and then it drops 
we, we recently sold Lange, um shopping center, right? Oh. And it was the same thing where the seller didn't want to contract, didn't want to contract, and eventually they said, okay, we'll take that deal and move on. And it was a really good deal for them, and it was a good deal for the purchaser. And so you've got to wait till it's the right deal for you. Don't just uh-huh. chase. Don't just uh-huh. chase. No, uh-huh. That's some of the best advice. Uh-huh. No. That's cool. So let's go to those tips. What are some of your best tips for somebody who really wants to do well? in commercial property investment? Look, for me, starting as a broker is a great one, right? Okay. Because you get to learn lots of different asset classes. You get to meet lots of different people in the industry where you actually now will build up clients and friends yes. and people who will back you going forward. So a lot of the biggest investors in the market all started as brokers. Ah. So it's a great spot to get in, you know, and yeah. it's a, it can also be very lucrative if you're good. Then you've got to work hard, understand your market, understand the properties, who plays in that environment. Yeah. Um, my partner in this business actually has a lot of residential property in Cape and he knows everything that's going on. He understands every agent in that area. It's amazing. He, he speaks to them every single day. He'll, you know, take them out for lunch, understand what's going, what's selling, what, be the first there, be the first to understand what stock's coming on and then really research what the value of that stock is. If something comes on and the rental's at 50 rand a square meter, yeah. is that market? Is that under market? Is yeah. that over market? Yeah, yeah. And, and what's the correct pricing for that? And then don't just... Be willing to lose the deal. If it's too expensive, don't buy it. Oh. And just go in on your terms and, and chase the market. Yeah. So. You spoke a lot about mentorship. Yeah. Why is that important? For me, it's, I've just had such great people in my life that have just guided me into certain decisions. Moving to Johannesburg, for example, mm. John Ledley said, listen, you know, um, Cape Town's a great gray area from the time that you're 18 to, you know, 45. Mm in four years time so <laughs> so he said it's just a gray area we yeah. th- you go to johannesburg to cut your teeth it's far harder business there people are business focused they're not you know sitting on the beach yeah great ad- great advice another one of my clients said you know there's there, there are no gl- gray areas and property it's all black and white you yeah. need to understand the parameters of what's happening in front of you you need to bite off more than you can chew and chew like hell to get through it uh, you uh. need to simplify things give me three reasons i should buy this property and not a thousand reasons. Don't get too technical. Don't overanalyze things. Just simplify what you're doing and move forward. So even the you know our, our, of this company, simplicity and real estate comes mm. from those lessons. Mm. And over time, just these lessons and ways of thinking, the people that, that have walked the path ahead of you, mm-hmm. they help you by giving you that information, and you, it just changed the way of thinking. So I read a lot. Mm. I listen a lot. I've got a lot of great sort of mentors that I chat to about. You know, difficult decisions that I have ahead of me, mm. um, whether it's a leadership thing, you mm. know, because leadership can mm-hmm. be, it's one of those positions that is a lonely position, you know. Absolutely. It, you know, you don't, you can't talk to everyone in your business about mm. the hard decision that you have to make. Mm. So you need people outside of your business that you can, you know, ping and, and see bounce what, ideas, you know, yeah. bounce ideas. Right. So for me, it's it's just been so invaluable um, to have those people around me. Even my friends have got, you know, brilliant Brilliant friends who've been very successful in their individual careers and lots of different, you know, marketing and uh, video and mm. hedge funds and trading and you know so many different things and just sharing where we are and 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 what everyone's going through has just been a great way to pave a, a career and 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 help my way of thinking. Yeah. Mm. Do you have kids? One. Yeah. You have one kid. Yeah, turning five and Jan, little, little girl. Yeah. Oh, what's the best advice that you would give about life in general? Wow, if I was talking to her um, or if I was talking to someone raising a child, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think... <laughs> or is it different when you're talking to her? <laughs> you know... I love it. I, 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 lo- I, I love to let her work things out herself. Yeah. You know, I can remember right from the time she was very young, I always let her work things out. I wasn't, I didn't just jump in and help yeah. her to navigate around an object or to understand something. Yeah. I would keep asking. And, and as a result, I think she's developed really well or well, I think she has but everyone yeah. loves their kids you know <laughs> um, and then I think just in general have fun you know I, yeah. I think especially in our business I tell everyone just have fun have fun if you're having fun doing this it's going to be a beautiful life and, and, and so that's something that I hold close to myself I like to have fun and I like to do it with people that I love working with mm. All right, John, we've come to the end of our conversation, but I really cannot let you go. I mean, you are the CEO after all. I'd like to know what can we look forward to from Galeti Corporate Real Estate? Yeah, so we've uh, we've got a big sort of expansion plan for the mm-hmm. business. Um, we've spent a lot of time investing in the technology that sort of runs this business. Yeah. It, it tracks markets connected to the deeds office. It's just a really great system, you know. So we've spent a lot of time there. So more development and direction in that system will probably 
you know, move out to market as, mm. as opposed to having it just as an internal system. So that's mm. a big thing for us. Mm. And then we're just going to sort of build up our service line. So the focus at the moment is we've got auction, which we're putting a lot of attention into. Corporate services is focusing deeply on the different sectors. And then our broking team is going to grow quite a bit over the next sort of year period. So mm. once that reaches a, a, a level where we're comfortable with it, it's reached that sort of settling period, then we're going to start looking at, the, at other service lines in the industry, you know. Um, and, and I think that's where we're going to go and we're going to use our tech as a wrap and, and on all the IP that pulls into this business mm. and that's really our, our main focus for the business. Yeah, mm. So a lot of building to be done. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. What did they say? Big data, big business. And I guess yeah. with the tech move, that's what you guys are ultimately yeah. trying to do. Big time, yeah. Very exciting. I went to your to your auction and I was really excited. And I'm thinking, you know what? We need to get somebody in this room to come and talk to us about the auction process. So guys, please look out for that video. With I love what you said about it. You got there and you were, this is a secret club or Listen, something. Listen, it like felt that. like a secret club. Guys, <laughs> I walked in there and I'm like, who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we not know what's happening here? And I'm really, really excited to really uncover some of those processes that go into auctions. And I think we're going to be speaking to some of you guys about it. But you've been absolutely I fantastic. I, 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 I can never thank you enough for the time you've taken today to really just give thank us you. a yeah, key. It's been great. You know yeah. what I mean? And I think there's a lot of things that we all think we know. And then you realize you don't know enough. And then you realize, okay, but there are people out there that have this information. So we're really, really And grateful. you asked me some interesting questions. You made me think there for a second. <laughs> I'm glad answer. to hear that. But thank you very much once again. And guys, thank you very thank much you. for tuning in. I will see you guys on the next one.